Hello and welcome to the Motivational Midwife. I'm Lynn Jones and today we're going to look at breach. So as always, we will start with a definition. So this is where the um, baby actually presents uh, in a longitudinal lie, but the buttocks are in the lower part of the uterus rather than the head. So your presenting part is, is the, the sacrum, the buttocks, um, and the bitrochantaric diameter, which is the diameter between these two points, the hips, is 10 centimetres. If you remember, your um, biparietal diameter is 9.5, so it actually sits quite nicely into the pelvis. And your denominator in this instance is the sacrum. So in 2017, uh, the RCOG did um, update their breach guidelines and they highlighted that uh, when the term breach trial was done many years ago, it really almost overnight uh, reduced the, um, the skill set of people who could actually facilitate safely breach birth. But breech births do continue for a variety of reasons, um, and not least of all maternal choice. And so it is essential that we really, really get those skills back um, into midwifery practice and to obstetric practice, because cesarean sections do have long term consequences. Um, and I, I will in the comments below put a link to breech birth um, dot org dot uk, which is uh, fantastic. Um, organization that actually are doing a lot of work into breach and a lot of training into supporting physiological breach, upright breach. Um, and certainly I trained with them a number of years ago and have um, helped facilitate some of the training. It is something I feel quite passionately about. I've been very fortunate to have facilitated a, quite a number of breach births over my career. Um, but if you get a chance to do the training, I would absolutely recommend it. So the guidance also states that the women should be informed when planning for a breach delivery that the risk of uh, mortality is about uh, 0 0.5 per thousand with cesarean section, um, 2 per thousand with planned vaginal breach. Um, and actually, alarmingly, it's 1 per thousand with a planned cathalic birth. So it's actually... Um, you know, you could have problems, double the chance of having problems with a vaginal breach as you would with a head down. But, you know, head down is not um, without risk itself. So the incidence, how often is this a problem? Well, if you've got a preterm baby, they're very often in, in a breach position. So it's, it's understandable that uh, your incidence amongst preterms is much higher so sort of 15 to 20 percent are likely to be breached but by the time we get to term most of these babies will have um, rotated into a cephalic presentation so only about three to four percent of term babies are in the breach um, presentation so we have different types of breach so we have our, our frank breach so this is where um, tuck your little arms in baby so this is where um, the hips are flexed, but the knees are extended. So this, these ones, the legs are right up here. And actually on abdominal examination, these ones are really, can be quite tricky to pick up because the head is splinted by the legs. And therefore, um, one of the key um, sort of telltale signs, which is a balottable head when you're palpating, um, it may not balot very easily because it is splinted by the, um, by the legs. So you have a, a complete breach, and this is where this baby is um, really sort of sitting almost in a little cross-legged position. Um, so the feet are crossed, but they're not below the buttocks. And then you've got sort of kneeling or footling breaches where the feet are down below the buttocks. So how might you recognise this? Well, you could, as I say, um, pick it up on abdominal palpation if 
if it's not an extended breach, then as you palpate in the upper part of the um, abdomen, the head will blot very easily between your fingers. It's hard. Um, head will be, you can feel it sort of bouncing between your fingers quite easily. Um, in labour, um, there will be meconium because obviously as the buttocks are coming through, it's being squeezed. But the difference between um, the meconium of a, of a normal um, delivering breech baby is that it is toothpaste like. It's like when you squeeze the, um, the tube of the toothpaste, you're getting a thick sort of line of toothpaste. You'll get a thick line of meconium and that's normal. Meconium stained glycor is not normal. So you have to be mindful. Um, you could pick it up on ultrasound um, and you might pick it up on vaginal examination. So on vaginal examination, um, and it's not, we do miss them um, quite a bit and I've missed them in my career as well. It's not always as easy as you think to, to pick it up on vaginal examination because when we go, we look at the, the mechanism and we will go over the mechanism again, um, you often, you've got a, an anterior hip leading so sometimes when you're doing a vaginal examination, particularly if membranes are intact, you can actually feel the, the hip bone. And so it feels hard. It feels like a head. And also if you're feeling um, what feels like a sagittal suture is actually the anal cleft. So it, it, it can be quite difficult to actually pick it up on vaginal examination. But often it will feel different. It, it feels softer. It doesn't feel... Uh, and if you have a little boy there, then um, sometimes it's a, it's a real telltale. You can tell that that's definitely not a head. Um, and classically, with the undiagnosed breaches, suddenly it's there on the perineum. And what risk factors will predispose women to um, a breach presentation? So as we've already said, preterm babies are much more likely to be in a breach presentation. So prematurity. And likewise, your growth restricted babies, because they're smaller, they've got more room to move. They often do get into uh, breech presentation. Multiple births, your second twin is very often breached because there just really isn't room for it to get round to um, a cephalic presentation. Polyhydramnius, again, you've got a lot of fluid in there. It's more likely the baby can get itself into different um, positions. And oligohydramnius, for the opposite reason, often it's got, it's in, it's in a breech position and then the there is a lack of fluid to help it to turn into a phallic presentation. If we've got any sort of pelvic abnormalities that may predispose the baby to, to really be more comfortable in a breech position, and likewise with anything else that's in the, the, um, the uterus, so fibroids, placenta, if you've got low-lying placenta, um, if there's tumours, anything like that that's in the percent, uh, in the uterus, it's going to predispose to a breach. If we've got fetal abnormalities such as anencephaly or hydrocephaly, so that will predispose to a breach um, because the head is larger, it finds a nice comfortable place to park itself. Uh, Multiparity because of tone, uh, you know, the more babies you've had, the more lax your abdominal muscles are, which makes it easier for the baby to um, really settle itself into a breach. Um, position and like with all of these um, emergencies although I always feel that breach shouldn't really sit in an emergencies it's, it's just a variation of normal in my opinion um, but previous breach if you've had a breach before then you're more likely to have another breach and cephalopelvic disproportion so actually you have got um, a baby that's just too big to go through that pelvis True cephalopelvic disproportion is fairly unusual. So when we're looking at management, we are thinking this is a time critical um, situation because uh, we do want that baby to be born fairly promptly. Um, so you, if you're in a hospital situation, and because we've said there is this lack of skill around, you do want your multidisciplinary team and you really want the most skilled people there to deal with this. Explain to the to the woman and her partner really that this baby is uh, presenting by its bottom rather than its head, and obviously auscultate your fetal heart carefully. Once that baby is um, really delivering, uh, auscultating the fetal heart is going to be much more um, problematic because 
your uh, where you would normally pick a fetal heart up is going to be really deeply into the pelvis, so you're not going to hear it terribly well at all, uh, at all which is why we really want this baby to deliver um, fairly promptly. And se seven minutes is, is usually a, a good time indicator. And if you do the um, breach, breach birth um, organisations training, um, Sean Walker, who is excellent, um, has developed a flowchart for really uh, promptly delivering these babies and they should if we don't interfere and people are, are spontaneously birthing um, then they will deliver actually quite quickly so prepare for delivery in most hospitals uh, women will although you should be really supporting women in their choice of position for birth and many will choose to be in all fours or a more upright position um, if help is required the skill that does exist tends to exist um, with women in a modified lithotomy position. So they're, they're on their backs with their feet up a little bit. And it should be explained to women um, before they get to that point that should help be required, um, that they may be asked to change position. And then pre prepare for resuscitation of the baby because it can be a hypoxic event for this baby. So you will have compression of the cord. So um, the baby may require some resuscitation at birth. So what options do women have um, for breach? Well, spontaneous birth is always the best option. Um, it just does it. We just really facilitate. Um, assisted breach is where the buttocks are born, but we need to use some manoeuvres to deliver the arms and the head. And a breach extraction, really, this is not, this is not a midwifery um, Maneuver, this is this is your obstetrician needs to intervene because the baby is compromised. Um, and cesarean section. And obviously, for a lot of women with a decline of um, expertise, cesarean section is sometimes the only choice these women have. And as I've said about breach, breach birth, um, the org.uk, which is Sean Walker, um, who is currently undertaking some more research um, around breach, uh, which is very exciting. So let's just recap on the mechanisms of breech birth. So we start with a slightly anterior position, um, left sacral anterior, and the, rot the baby rotates, so the sacrum um, enters the pelvis in the transverse diameter. So if you were to do a VE, you would feel the anal cleft in the transverse. And I'm just going to turn the pelvis round so she is in a more upright position. The bottom then continues to descend by a process of lateral spinal flexion. So essentially the baby wiggles from side to side and the anterior buttock descends first, followed by the anal cleft and then the posterior buttock. So in um, cephalic presentations, we talk about crowning. In breech, we talk about rumping. And rumping happens when the bitrochanteric diameter passes through the perineum. So that's the two hip bones, the diameter between your two hip bones. When that passes through the perineum, um, rumping has happened and the baby rotates. So the sacrum is anterior, so tum to bum. The baby's tummy is towards the mother's bottom. And that doesn't matter which way around she is, upright or um, lithotomy. Inside, the shoulders are rotating to the transverse diameter so they can enter the pelvis. And there's a slight rotation which brings the arm um, down to be born under the pubic arch. The head is then rotating inside to enter the pelvis. And as the head descends into the pel pelvis, it rotates back to an anterior position. The posterior arm is born and the head then rotates into full alignment. The baby does a, a reflex tummy crunch and the head is born by flexion under the sacral curve. So uh, many of you will have heard the term hands off the breech. And it is a term that uh was brought into play with with good intentions but the problem is, that's happened is people become so um tied up about that keeping their hands off the breach that actually they then don't intervene when they should intervene appropriately so a better terminology and certainly sean's um training suggests that we use the phrase respect the mechanism so if the mechanism if you know your mechanism of breach well and you can see that mechanism working 
um, then you really you don't need to interfere. But if the mechanism has stopped, is not working, then you really need to do um, manoeuvres to assist that baby and restore the mechanism. Okay, so we really only do those me uh, mechanisms when the process has stopped, you know, the, the baby is not descending, um, and if we need to deliver the head slowly for any reason. So um, I'm going to discuss the um, RCOG's manoeuvres because that is the ones that you will most likely um, come across in practice. But again, I would um, strongly um, encourage you to do breachbirth.org's um, UK's training. They do offer an online um, course, which is, uh, but face to face is obviously better, but COVID has made that more problematic. But hopefully that is coming back into um, more of a, a viable option, that it, it really does help you cement the mechanism and the manoeuvres are slightly different in how you would um, help that baby should help be required to restore the mechanism in an upright position. So for these um, manoeuvres, we're looking at women who are on their back in a modified lithotomy position. So if the legs do not birth spontaneously, and most of the time they will, but if they don't birth spontaneously, um, then the manoeuvre you might need to do is something called popliteal pressure. So you're actually putting pressure on the back of the baby's knee. So if you think, um, if you were to have somebody, you know, put their knee behind your knee, your knee automatically bends um, and the baby is no different. If you press, press on the back of the baby's um, leg, the knee will bend. Okay, so it will bend and then you will be able to bring the foot down and slightly abduct the leg so that it comes out. And the second one would often deliver on its own. If it doesn't, um, then uh, um, just do repeat the process. So popliteal pressure, um, you'll be able to get the ankle and just help bring the foot down. If, um, in, through this whole process, really, you should be encouraging the, the woman to follow her own body. Um, we shouldn't be waiting for the next contraction as such, because when the baby is, is in the pelvis, there's nothing left in the uterus. So um, contractions are likely to go off a little bit. So really, and you'll find that most women will push almost continuously when they have a breach. Uh, which is why birth within seven minutes of rumping is not not uncommon in a physiological birth. Okay, so um, once that those legs have delivered, um, you will the body should come down a little bit more. You'll notice the cord, and at this point, this is where the cord will be um, being compressed quite well against the pelvis. So note the time, note the colour of the cord, get your scribe to um, document those things for you. Um, if the arms don't deliver, then we do a, a manoeuvre called love sets manoeuvre. But obviously you can't do that until you can at least see the scapula. So you need, you need the baby to have come down a little bit more um, before you can see the, um, see the scapula and then you'll be able to help deliver the arms. Um, you'll sometimes see obstetricians drape the, the body with a warm towel, but you're trying not to, to stimulate the baby. My personal preference is not to use a towel. Um, you should only really be putting your fingers on the bony prominences. Okay, If you have a towel there, um, you could have your hands really over the soft parts of the abdomen and therefore you could cause um, damage to internal organs. So really you, you need to be holding just those bony pelvis parts. And love sets manoeuvre, what you are doing um, is you are rotating the baby 90 degrees initially, so you will see the upper part um, of the arm, and then you can put a finger in over the top of the shoulder and sweep the arm down till it comes out. Then you need to rotate the baby through 180 degrees to get the other arm and repeat the same thing. And then when that arm is delivered, rotate the baby back so we are still tum to bum. So the back. If the woman is in um, 
a semi-recumbent position, modified lithotomy. Um, it's the baby's back that is going to be, you're going to be seeing. If she is upright, then it's the baby's front you will be seeing. Okay, then allow the baby um, to hang slightly until you can see the nape of the neck. Once you can see the nape of the neck, you are doing a, a modified Moriso smelly beat manoeuvre. So um, you are put, essentially you're putting two fingers on the suborbital ridges and on the back of the baby's head, you've got two fingers over your shoulders and one on the occiput. So what you're trying to do is flex the head a little bit and as you flex the head you are following the pelvic curve so that line of the birth canal you're following that pelvic curve until the baby um, delivers and what you really want is that head to deliver slowly so you don't get any rapid compression decompression you want a nice gentle birth of that baby's head so if the baby needs some resuscitation, there is uh, most of them will only need primary resuscitation, so there is no big rush to um, cramp and cut the cord. You can do your primary resuscitation with the cord attached um, uh, and on mother. If the baby looks like it needs more resuscitation, then resus council would suggest that you don't delay clamping and cutting the cord in order to resuscitate the baby. There are some units who have very nice um, bedside resuscitation tables so they can actually resuscitate the baby a bit more extensively while attached to the cord and also near the parents so the parents can see. It's um, useful to take cord gases, if, particularly if there's been any delay. Um, and then the third stage management, really, it's very much dependent on um, parity and, and the type of delivery she's had. If we've had a breech extraction, then she is more likely to have a postpartum hemorrhage because there's been a lot more interference. So maybe an active third stage may be um, advised. Um, but it is her preference. It is down entirely down to maternal preference. And with all babies, we want them to have skin to skin. Um, keep them warm, a nice early feed, um, so that they um, replenish their stores. So possible consequences for the baby. So we can, they can have, uh, these babies are at risk of um, dislocation of the hips anyway, so they would need to be referred for a hip scan. And that would be um, part of your NIPE process, obviously, is these, that is a risk factor for um, developmental hip dysplasia. So you need to make sure that your paediatrician or yourself, if you're NIPE trained, has um, done that referral for a hip scan. We could also cause those dis uh, dislocation of the hips by excessive traction, um, fractures of the humerus clavicle or fem femur. Again, if you haven't got hold of the baby by the bony pelvis or, or you're a little overzealous with your um, rotations you could cause um, fractures um, or dislocations, spinal cord damage, um, internal organ damage if you're not holding in the correct place. Um, Herb's palsy you may have if again if there's been excessive traction on the brachial plexus. Um, our five H's of resuscitation uh, again as I say if it's been a spontaneous breach these are less likely to be an issue. Um, babies do die um, not very often, thankfully, but they do, they can die. And intracranial hemorrhage um, can be an issue. And that's often from that rapid compression, decompression um, can be a problem and cause um, these uh, hemorrhages. So these would be babies um, that may, the discussion around vitamin K may need to um, happen in a little bit more depth. And uh, obviously, if the baby has been poorly at birth, um, then there may be some separation issues if the baby needs to go to special care for observation or any sort of treatment. For mother, um, then if um, it has not been a spontaneous birth, if you've had to undertake any manoeuvres to assist the birth of the baby to restore the mechanism, then um, there may be uh, trauma to the urethra. Um, or soft tissue trauma 
Um, and of course, if it's an undiagnosed breach, then it can be quite traumatic to suddenly know that you've got your baby's not the right way around and a lot of people come into the room quite quickly. Um, I put query postpartum hemorrhage because I think it depends potentially on the amount of interference, um, plus or minus whatever trauma, the uh, tissue trauma she, she has that could predispose her slightly. But um, for, if it's a spontaneous um, breach birth with no interference, then she's not really any more at risk of postpartum hemorrhage than anybody else. And there we have it, breach birth. So I hope you found that useful, uh, a nice reminder of the mechanisms uh, as well as um, how to facilitate the birth. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do so. We also have a Facebook page you can follow and I look forward to seeing you next time.